host uh, Zakaria Banda. My guest uh, this morning is um, Honorable Rafael Makachinda. He is uh, the Patriotic Front Information and Publicity Chairperson, a member of uh, the Central Committee. Uh, good morning and welcome to uh, the program, sir. Um, Mr. Branda, good uh, morning and uh, good morning to our listeners and uh, good morning to my brother, uh, Mr. Nwankoma. Uh, I look forward to an informative discussion. Indeed. Like you mentioned, uh, in the studio we also have uh, Mr. Nwankoma. He is an economist and uh, the United Party for National Development member. Uh, always a pleasure to have you, uh, Mr. Nkoma, and welcome to the program. Uh, thank you, Zach, and uh, may I also recognize uh, my leader here, uh, Honorable Rafael Nagachinda, and also to the listeners there, thank you for tuning in, and uh, to our crew and uh, support, support staff here. Indeed. Thank you. So, uh, we're going to uh, obviously look at a number of uh, interesting uh, uh, issues, uh, both politics, uh, we'll look at the economy, and... Uh, and many others. So let's start first of all. Uh, let me let me first and foremost recognize the fact that uh, in very few weeks' time, uh, the United Party for National Development (UPND) will be clocking two years in office. And um, uh, if I was to ask, how much could you say you have so far achieved in relation to your campaign promises, Mr. No? Um, thank you once again. I think that is a very loaded uh, uh, question, uh, loaded in the sense that uh, uh, there's so much that I think uh, can be said in as far as uh, our success stories. And I think as UPND, uh, we indeed campaigned on a platform uh, to transfer, transform uh, people's uh, lives, uh, living standards, and welfare. And uh, it would be actually naive to suggest that uh, we have not made strides towards that direction. And I'll tell you why. Mm. First of all, uh, when we assumed office, we did recognize that uh, there was going to be need for huge, what you call, structural reforms. Structural reforms in the economy. Because at that point, the economy was basically in ICU. Right? And uh, to be able to uh, reform the economy, there were drastic steps <coughs> and measures that had to be taken. And one of the things that I think uh, uh, we should not hide away from was the fact that it has taken us longer than we had anticipated to be able to reach the stage of what you call a debt, uh, uh, debt restructuring. This basically has been the elephant in the room. All the promises that, as UPND, we made were anchored on the fact that, first of all, we needed to stabilize the economy, take it out of ICU, stabilize it, and begin to consolidate and make progress. So for anyone to suggest that in the last two years that we have been in office, there is no success story, I think we have done a lot. And I'll tell you why. First of all, debt restructuring itself was the key to be able to open opportunities. Opportunities in terms of beginning to grow the economy, beginning to create uh, opportunities for our youths uh, in employment, um, employment opportunities, to begin also to create or unlock liquidity into the economy so that those entrepreneurs, the farmers, and all sectors of the economy begin to get the benefit of not only a stabilized economy, but an economy which is beginning to post growth. Mind you, we took office uh, on the back of an economy which was in the recession. Negative uh, growth. We are now projecting that this year we should be somewhere around 5% growth or positive growth. Now, it's not easy for people to be able to get what you call trickle-down effects almost immediately. But I will demonstrate during the conversation that there are those uh, trickle-down effects that have begin of the, began to impact on our people positively. Things like CDA, for example, that is one way of unlocking liquidity and also beginning to pass on those benefits of a stable economy, uh, an economy which is beginning to demonstrate 
growth to the people who basically deserve that intervention more. So I think in opening, I can only state that there are so many successes which uh, we have scored, and the biggest being able to achieve debt restructure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In short, uh, uh, Honorable Nakachinda, what uh, Mr. Nkoma is saying that uh, uh, the snail's pace that the UPND has had in terms of development was mainly caused by your regime, which obviously left this, uh, uh, the, the economy of this country in ICU. How do you react to that? Um, I think for, for a start, um, uh, allow me to sympathize with Mr. Nkoma uh, to try and uh, project a, a hopeful situation in the midst of a mess. Uh, it's quite a mammoth task. And uh, no matter how skilled you may be, uh, if you're speaking away from reality, uh, you may just obviously uh, trade with rhetoric that may not translate into something the people out there will understand. He started by saying the promise of the UPND was to come into government to transform the lives of the people of Zambia. And uh, <clears throat> If that is the case, uh, it means that uh, uh, we must examine what kind of uh, uh, change have the people of Zambia so far experienced. And uh, to be realistic, because I think when it comes to the economy, uh, economics is a science that is not in abstract. It's about real life. Um, you know, science that deals with day-to-day -day, uh, livelihood of people. They have, yes, done a fantastic job in transforming people's lives, in my view, by increasing the f price of minimum from one from 90 kwacha at most 130 kwacha to almost 400 kwacha today. The price of minimum is around 380 kwacha. So if I thought it is uh, in that regard that they came to transform people's lives, they've done a fantastic job. Because my mother, my aunt, my cousins, our people uh, out there are struggling. Some of them, um, the price of minimum is actually half the allowance of money they generate from their little economic activities. They promise to transform lives, the lives of Zambian people by ensuring that when it comes to production in the farming sector, uh, agriculture sector, they will reduce the price of agriculture, I mean, uh, of agriculture inputs, particularly fertilizer. Uh, President Daka in the is on record promising that the bag of, I mean, of fertilizer will reduce to 250. At the time that he was making those promises, uh, where Mr. Nkoma is trying to suggest that the economy was in ICU, the bag of fertilizer was just around 600 to 700 kwacha. Today, the bag of minimum, I mean, of fertilizer is above 1,300, 1,400 kwacha. Um, they promise to transform people's lives uh, by uh, uh, further promising that uh, uh, in opposition, they had presented themselves uh, better to uh, stakeholders and people that intended to invest in Zambia. Uh, Mr. Kainde Chirema was out there. Uh, pro pronouncing himself that he had already secured uh, money to a tune of $25 billion. Um, and that within 10 days after him being inaugurated, uh, those pledges will be actualized. <coughs> this is two years down the line. Um, uh, the, the rhetoric that we've been fed with is the same one that Mr. Nkoma is trying to repeat here, an IMF rhetoric. And IMF rhetoric in the sense that, oh, uh, the economy was in ICU when Patriotic Front was in government. But they don't qualify the reason for which we had found ourselves in that situation. It's not only Zambia that found itself in an isolated situation of having the economy struggle. We know that the devastating effect of COVID-19, which the UPND must acknowledge, is what led to what they sometimes try to twist or manipulate to advance a narrative that uh, were actually negative in terms of economic growth. The negative economic growth for Zambia was global. Even some of the renowned, strong, and big economics
costed negative growth. Actually, for Zambia, we were even at some point, if you remember, rated among the four best performing uh, countries during the time of COVID, not only in terms of managing uh, the COVID situation, but also managing uh, the economic situation, because I think for some countries it was very devastating. So they were making pronouncements, fantastic pronouncements, that you'd wonder, are they living within the same environment we are living, or this is just a deceptive uh, a trick to get into government. I appreciate the fact that Mr. Nkoma has admitted that what they projected and they were talking about, which I think were just, uh, you know, <laughs> daydreaming, now the reality has hit and they are confused on how to handle the situation and the situation is actually get, getting worse. As I maybe conclude my, my first <laughs> submission, because I'm talking and debating with Mr. Nkoma, I want us to be realistic. We can never talk of economic growth anywhere, whether it is PF in government or UPN in government, if the aspect of production is not on the table. The issue of debt restructuring, that's an IMF rhetoric. It's about you know, trying to find a way in which we can mitigate the fact that we owe and we need to pay back. But that restructuring doesn't answer to the fact that we're going, to able to, we're going to be able to pay, whether now or in the future, if the aspect of production is not you know, um, and, uh, resolved. Uh, well, of course, I was Zooming when we were coming. I needed to understand the, mm -hmm. the guests that I'm going to you know, debate with. I know that he may have been passed through Minister of Finance. I expect him to come and report on this station whether or not Mr. Msokotwane and Chipoka Mulenga are having regular meetings to discuss issues of production, whether it is in terms of manufacturing and so on, especially that in the agriculture sector they have failed to perform. It's a disaster. So I can only say that if he is going to assure not only me but the Zambian people that there is a deliberate uh, effort away from the IMF tables and boardrooms, away from World Bank boardrooms to which pe people are even being uh, rewarded and uh, pronounced heroes when in fact <laughs> where they are coming from here in Zambia things are a mess. We want to see whether he's going to demonstrate steps that are being taken towards production. But I can tell you, uh, this government, the ruling UPND, are more in exchange of rhetoric, especially the one that is caved for them by the IMF uh, as an institution. And of course, Mr. Uh, Honorable Nakachinda puts uh, across to you, uh, Mr. Nkoma, a very critical issue that, uh, you know, the progression of the economy must be dependent on production. And production is, is indeed uh, an issue that uh, need, this country needs to implement for it to see uh, the light of day as far as uh, economic independence is concerned. I mean, <laughs> do, you have, do you have anything that he has uh, put to you as a challenge now uh, to demonstrate that uh, this regime uh, is uh, focused in terms of uh, uh, production? Yes. <clears throat> um, I just want to also uh, sympathize with uh, the PF administration. First of all, what my brother here, Honor Banakachinda, is saying is that they are not admitting Right? They are not admitting the fact that they created the mess that UPND is trying to resolve. And I will demonstrate to you. First of all, he talks about that Zambia, under their stewardship, towards the end of their tenure, was rated among one of the best top four performing economies. That's a lie. And I'll tell you why. There is no country in sub-Saharan Africa notwithstanding the COVID impact, notwithstanding the global economic slowdown and meltdown, ever triggered what you call a debt standstill or a debt default. We are the first. Is that a measure of success? Is that a measure of prudent economic management? No, it's a failure. It's a failure, it's a total failure. The beginning, that is basically the end of what you call uh, economic management, uh, 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 economic management process. When you say to yourselves, "We have given up," they gave up on the economy. The economy was in what you call uh, autopilot. In the last two years of the PF administration, right, we had for the first time the inflation rate 
but the rate at which uh, the prices increase at par with the exchange rate 20 24 24.6 i raised it on this program that never have we ever seen this kind of economic uh, mismanagement then two if you say that uh, the lives of the German people were better under PF than they are now. I mentioned one thing, to stabilize the economy. The economy was in a mess. We are now able to see, one, that uh, there is hope. And why do I say so? He talked about uh, uh, the president making, during the time he was in opposition, making uh, pronouncements to the effect that Zambia who attract so much investment and so on. Can he also admit that in the last two years of the PF administration, there was no new industry. They closed the mines. The mess we are seeing on the copper belt, KCM, Mopan, it existed. The, the mess was created in the last two years of the administration where a mine investor abandons a mine. Mopan. They literally abandoned a mine. Now, is that what you call prudent economic management? KCM. What has happened to KCM? Collapsing the entire copper belt. It was under their watch. And how did they want to mitigate that? By becoming Father Christmases. They were going with bags of money, lots of money, to be able to appease the poor people who had lost jobs in the mines. The poor people who were looking for sustainable empowerment opportunities, like jobs. They failed to create jobs. Then, now, as I'm talking to you, just yesterday, the biggest nickel mine in Zambia has been operationalized, going to create 700 jobs. The nickel mine in, uh, in uh, Kalumbira. Right? As we're talking now, the Minister of Mines is on record that uh, the Mopani and the KCM Mines are about to resume production. An announcement is imminent. The damage was such that to re, um, uh, to, to re energize and re uh, restore credibility for investors in this country was a mammoth task. Because, first of all, we lost the little credibility that he was in MMD. Right? Can Honorable Rafael Nakachinda tell me? At the time that MMD was handing over power to PF, what was the price of uh, fertilizer? Did you tell me? It was 300. Right? What did they leave it at as PF when they were leaving government? They left the price of fertilizer at 700, 800. Now, are you telling me that in that 10 years they transformed the people's lives looking at the indices I'm talking about? The answer is no. What did they find the price of Minimil when they were taking over government? As he, uh, uh, when he was handing over, he was in MMT, handing over to PF. At what price of Minimil was, uh, was the bag? Was it not 60? What did they hand over to? 140, 200, I mean 140, 160. So let us first of all be realistic. He talked about, we cannot talk about economics in a vacuum. And I'll tell you about economics. One of the things that you have to understand that every country has got what you call an index which is called an inflation index. Little. There's no time that Zambia has a negative or deflation, negative. We are the right inflation is <coughs> minus five, minus two, minus three. No. It's always plus. Every country, even Britain, even USA. So now, what does that inflation mean? Inflation basically means that prices in any economy will never remain static. They'll increase. But what any responsible government does is to make sure that that increase is more or less at a slower pace. Right? At a slower pace. Now, you are talking about uh, that UPND has got no economic recovery uh, program. If we did not have an economic recovery program, we would not have achieved debt restructuring. They failed. Three ministers under PF failed to get debt restructuring. They failed to get an IMFD. Margaret Ponakatwe, Honorable Felix Mtati, Honorable Wadema. They failed. They were every now and then trekking to Washington 
Why? It's because they did not have an iota of credibility. They never had an economic recovery program. The economic recovery program that we have, which we have been transparent, and we have been uh, publicizing, here is it. But they just don't want to admit that things are happening. It has been so, so uh, transparent to the extent that even that one who does not want to agree with us has been able to agree. Let me just conclude. We have demonstrated that we many well. Then killed uh, nitrogen chemicals of Zambia. Have you seen the effort, the investment that we are putting back to nitrogen chemicals of Zambia? When they came in as PF, they found, yes, nitrogen chemicals of Zambia Olympic, but now nitrogen chemicals of Zambia is almost posting 60-70% uh, capacity in production. We have managed under our two years, as short as it may be, to get United Capital Fertilizer to start producing fertilizer. Right? There are one or two more fertilizer plants that we're about to, which are about to be commissioned. And this is our intervention in the agriculture sector because we know that an economy outside agriculture is neither there or here. Then two, just look at how they treated the farmers. When they were leaving government, the exchange rate was at about 2024. 20, how much was they paying in 50 kg bank of uh, maize to a farmer? 150. 150 divide that by 24. How much does it give you? $8? Correct? We are now paying 250. Divide so today's rate. Is it 17? By 250. How much is that? What does it give you? Over 10. 13 dollars. $13, almost double what they left. So who was making a genuine effort to transform people's lives between what they left and what we're trying to do. It may not be at the pace that we'd like it to be because there are things which are humanly impossible for us to be able to accelerate. But there is a genuine demonstration of a leadership which knows what it, which has got a plan and knows what it is what it's doing and it knows where it is going. I'll pause there for now. Thanks. Mr. Nagachinda, let me, let, me, let me move to uh, the fact that the UPND appears to have achieved a lot, uh, even just from what he has explained in less than two years of, of their being in office, compared to what uh, the PF during the 10 years, uh, uh, for, example, during, uh, for example, the UPND boss of uh, increasing CDF allocation to you know, 28.5 million kwacha. Uh, they boast of having brought uh, free education, uh, removed cadres in bus stations and markets, including restoring the rule of law. Why has, why is it difficult or so difficult for you, the Patriotic Front, to actually, uh, uh, you know, accept that these are these are there? And why is it that it's so difficult uh, for 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 you to really uh, commend these? Uh, visible achievements that uh, the UPND has always uh, 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 talked about in the in the past two years. Well, I think it's important for me to first of all briefly rebut um, okay. the assertion. First of all, to try and suggest that uh, I'm presenting lies. Uh, I think the Zambian people know uh, who have the propensity to tell lies. Uh, and we don't have to compete on that. I think if we were to competing in terms of telling lies, the winners are already known. Mr. Nkoma is saying that uh, are trying to boast and emphasize that the achievement has to do with debt restructuring. And he's trying to suggest here that as patriotic front we are thrown in the towel, when in fact we're just being prudent in approaching uh, issues of uh, debt restructuring. How? We knew that uh, having been, you know, greatly um, affected and devastated by the COVID situation, there was no way we could have proceeded, especially uh, that it was just after the after aftermath of the effects of the climate change, we could pay because the issues of production had gone down. Dr. Wariangandu only invoked a proviso or provision um, uh, in the debt agreement within the G20, um, uh, you know, uh, debt management framework, 
and uh, to that effect indicate that in terms of uh, if we proceed to pay um, some of the obligation at that particular time, we were not being able to sustain. And therefore, we needed to immediately engage because, of course, there were they were about fasted sets of um, people that we owed. So there was no way you could treat, uh, uh, use double standard in treating those that you owe. So even when we could afford, for example, if I owe Mr. Banda, I owe Mr. Nkoma, I owe um, the other gentleman there, and uh, uh, I have an obligation to pay all of you, and you know that uh, I owe all of you. There was no way I could give Mr. Nkoma special treatment. For me to be able to sustain uh, my relationship and be able to pay you back, you should also be confident that the same way I'm treating Mr. Nkoma as a, a creditor is the same way I'm treating you and treating the other person. Hence, this debt restructuring program that Mr. Nkoma wants to boast about was initiated by Patriotic Front. We are the ones who even contracted Razad as a consultant to be able to undertake this process. So of course, it was towards an election, and uh, to that effect, uh, you know, PF got in, I mean, UPD got into government. They carried through with the same consultant contracted by Patriotic Front. So the achievement that they want to clothe themselves with and boast about was initiated under Patriotic Front. The IMF program that he wants to say we didn't cut a deal, the only difference is that for us we didn't want to surrender our soul to IMF programs. We had insisted under the leadership of President Edgar Chagarungu that we, uh, if you remember there was a, a famous, uh, you know, pronouncement that we want to have homegrown solutions. So even when we're engaging IMF, we don't want to literally just surrender to IMF conditions that will devastate the local uh, people. The reason today we are having even issues of, for example, the poorest of the poor uh, being kicked out of the streets in the manner they are being kicked out. Some of these are even tied to IMF uh, conditions. When it comes to issues of the mines, because, you know, at global level, uh, and I want to believe Mr. Nkoma should know he has worked for big banks uh, and all that. He knows that when it comes to people in charge of um, uh, who run the global economy, uh, basically the same empires. They have interest in whether it's World Bank, they have interest in IMF and so on. And as a small economy as Zambia, we have to really be tactful in how we deal and navigate around the global syndicates. And to that effect, when IMF is put imposing certain conditions, I can tell you there are conditions that favor possibly people who also have an interest in IMF. So to that effect, our uh, insistence that we have to, ins uh, to have uh, homegrown uh, solutions in, in so far as the IMF program is concerned is what caused IMF to delay. And they knew the election is coming. And to that effect, the UPND uh, ran with a narrative that were failed to cut a deal and so on. Okay, two years down the line, he said that we didn't pay. The question I ask is that have you paid any of the debtors? Yes. Actually, the derailment that has happened, even for this so-called debt restructuring, is because of their reckless uh, shift in terms of policy position. We have always held traditionally from counter days an unaligned uh, you know, policy position as a country. We were friends of everybody. But when they get, got into government, they decided to give what seemed like a, a cold shoulder to the East, China being among those uh, in that uh, bracket. And to that effect, it delayed the negotiations. Had we been given an opportunity to get back into government, I can tell you the debt destruction was going to be resolved faster than what has happened two years down the line. And yet, they are continue on the blame game. Now, you have asked a question in relation to uh, what they are suggesting that uh, is a success story, the CDF. Look, the UPND, maybe because of not understanding how govern, government works, you know, uh, aspiring to get into office in one thing is one thing, but to know what to do when you get there is another. There has always been a debate in this country about this decentralization a program that I think and a template that has been interrogated for some time. Uh, the UPND, because of the inclination towards populism, the president comes and just makes an, a knee-jerk pronouncement, I'm increasing CDF. Even the legal framework was not put in place, attempting to do that now. Now to have that you know, implemented, they have found themselves in a very chaotic situation. So they have pulled money from sector ministries, brought it under local government, and they have, for purposes of 
poly, poly, populism and poly, politics. They have pronounced that they are giving each constituency 28.3 uh, uh, million kwacha. But then they come and say every uh, demand from uh, the people uh, of Zambia in relation to uh, the services they need from government, whether it's a construction, construction of roads, whether it is a, you know, health facilities, whether it is issues to do with bazaars and so on in, in, in education, and every aspect that, you know, Zambians have to deal with every other day. They are saying they see DF money. Empowerment, they see a DF money. When uh, before, CDF was basically just a, a pace, uh, some money put in the pace of um, uh, a member of parliament through local government to be able to meet, mitigate uh, small, small projects that don't need uh, the bureaucrats of uh, government to be able to, to meet. Today, um, under the sleeves of UPND, they have borrowed over $1 billion dollars he is saying that we left a, a debt which we haven't paid. But the debt which we didn't pay translates into Kazungura Bridge, which he, his president, Mr. Nongkoma, has been boasting around. I'm sure you remember he was in Livingston saying this is a good project. He even misled himself that we have constructed uh, as if it is a project that they undertook and implemented themselves without even acknowledging that this is a project that was left by us uh, in our patriotic front. Maybe he meant uh, as a country this is what we have achieved. No, as no, no. Country. Don't uh, try and help them with rhetoric because they manipulate rhetoric. Every time you challenge them that uh, what you are, you are lying, then they say, no, no, we meant a country. Mr. Akandichirim was very clear that we have built for you this, uh, this bridge. And the taxpayers, uh, that's what it means. The taxpayers are <laughs> No, no, let, let's, let's move uh, you know, okay. slowly. Yeah. For us, the money we borrowed, which we were beginning to restructure and how we pay back, is translated in what? You know, Kafio uh, Loa, Goj Loa, which has wiped out the you know, um, road shedding. Of course, it's returning because at some point these people went and started cutting deals with foreign, you know, countries and places where they needed to sell, um, you know, electricity. But the investment um, in that uh, in in that sector uh, is the only uh, is the third uh, large investment in the energy sector, Mr. Mr. Banda. The first one was the federal government in 1956. The second one was under UNIP in 1973. The only other government that has been able to make meaningful investment in the energy sector in terms of generation and distribution of power is under patriotic front, whether it is the improvement you know, under the Itestesi and also the Kafio Loa, uh, Goj Loa. All that is not acknowledged. They just come and lump in the face of the Zambian people, PF borrowed. They don't talk about um, uh, the road network that we've been able to put up. They try to ridicule the airports and everything that we have been able to put up out of the money that we, we acquired and acknowledge that this infrastructure was necessary for us to now have a base to which the economy should begin to come up. The issue of COVID is, you can't blame it on UPND, you can't blame it on patriotic front, is the situation that the whole globe was faced with. We can only then sit as citizens but as patriotic, patriotic citizens to say, how do we navigate in view of the fact that there's a reality of the impact of COVID? If they are saying, having just come in after COVID, we have found difficulties. What we were projecting from the time we formed as a political party, as opposition, then in 1997-98, and now at the time that we're being ushered into government, dynamics have changed and the realities have changed and therefore our plan can't work now. We have to reconfigure it. That's a reasonable thing to say. But to suggest that they had a fantastic you know, program, it's just that the problem that the PF left is too huge and uh, they have been having difficulties of it. Why did you aspire to get into government if you don't have the skill to navigate through the problems that you were promising you can solve within days? So in this case, if that is the position, it means that Mr. Nkoma has come on behalf of UPND, on behalf of Mr. Haka and HLMA, on this station to come and admit that we don't have the skill to navigate. Two years down the line, we have not had a, a, a solution, therefore we'll be blaming PF. I think, uh, maybe quickly, let me just yeah. respond to uh, my brother here. First of all, I did anchor the fact that to this stage, what has made us even resolve the debt uh, issue is around our homegrown economic recovery program. We have not departed from that. So I want to reaffirm to my brother here, Honorable uh, Nakachinda, we have a homegrown economic recovery program. That is what 
you are beginning to see the benefits now. The benefits in terms of the CDF you have talked about. Because mind you, under your regime, at the time that you were handing over power, how many constituencies had not received the CDF? Many. But it was pronounced in the budget as paltry as 1. Is it 1.2 million? 1.6. It was selectively given to those who were aligned to their um, political aspirations and the many constituencies went two, three years without receiving CDF. But right now, as I'm talking, every three months, the Ministry of Finance releases a bulletin. All constituencies have received CDF. It has never happened. And I'm happy that, that they are not acknowledging that indeed there are good things happen. Then when you talk about Kafiwe Gojlova, I've been on record, even on this program, I've acknowledged there are some good things that PF did. We don't dispute. Like MMD, there are some good things that they did. And I, for one, I get saddened when we cannot acknowledge some of the good things. But there are so many other things that they did which speaks to poor judgment on the part of the PF. And I'll give you two examples. Two examples. One, they're talking about reinvestment in infrastructure. Ask my brother here, at what cost? At what cost? Their projects were highly inflated. Highly inflated. And we can give examples here. He talks about Kafiwe Lower Gorge. Can he also admit, he was a cabinet minister, he was sitting in cabinet, that at the point that they were leaving government, the contractor, I think Sino Hydro, had abandoned Kafiwe, Kafiwe Lower Gorge because they failed to pay a huge outstanding amount of over a billion dollars. <laughs> the time that they were coming to government, I was sitting on the ERB board. We went to, on a site visit to Kafiwe Lower Gorge before the president went to commission it. I think there were about five turbines, if I'm not mistaken. Only two had been installed but not even commissioned. And the works were abandoned. The ZESCO managing director was on record that we have mobilized internal resources to pay the contractor to finish the works. So if the president goes there to commission and says we have delivered this project, the president is not saying money is coming from his pocket. He's saying the Zambian people under the new donor administration Otherwise, that was an abandoned project. He talks about airports. Lusaka, let's go to Lusaka International Airport. Kenneth County International Airport. Can you tell us what was the cost envelope for that project? $300 million plus. Are you telling me that there was economic justification and the money that they spent? Zimbabwe just recently commissioned the, an airport, international airport, I think. Uh, President Munaka was commissioning airport at half of what they committed to spend to the Zambian people. So, my brother, it's, we don't challenge or dispute some of the projects that you did. The issue that we have raised as UPND, and we're raising even with them in opposition, was at what cost were you incurring on those projects? Now, let me come to the issue of... Uh, Maybe before uh, he... Can I just finish, my brother? Just two minutes. W which issue are you, are you... I just want to talk about the issue that he talked about in terms of uh, uh, CDF. Can I just make just one comment? Right. First of all, when we do a budget as UPND, in the last two budgets that we've done, we have walked the talk. Right? We have walked it. Every commitment that we have made in the budget, we have fulfilled. Whether it comes to human capital investment, in terms of uh, teacher, nurses, doctors, uh, defense force, whatever, personnel, recruitment, we are fulfilled. When we put money in the budget for procurement of medicines, we discharge that commitment. So our budget, our budget is 100% performing. Unlike the budget which was underperforming by about 20-30%, they produced this huge yellow book and only delivered 20-30%. But we produce a yellow book, not as huge as they used to deliver, and we execute 100%. That is what we call prudent economic management. Honorable Akachinda, thank you. Did you want to add something before we move to the next item? Uh, well, maybe you can uh, proceed let's to move, ask. Let's move to the next mm. item. I mean, the UPND has been accused of uh, uh, changing its position uh, in that it condemned PF for removing street vendors when in opposition, right? But today, your party, UPND, 
has actually done the same, uh, Mr. Nkoma. How do you uh, defend that having been uh, having come earlier uh, when you were in opposition as a promise? Maybe, you would maybe the opposite. I would uh, you want to start request and uh, make any interventions since he was already on the floor. Right. You see our friends in UPND, and this is just, uh, you know, uh, away from politics, just an advice. Right. Uh, this appetite to always find an excuse, there's something vivid before you as an achievement by patriotic front. You say, at what cost? But you can't even justify, because now you're bringing technicalities justify the insinuation that, for example, uh, let's talk of Kazungura Bridge. Is he suggesting that it was at a, you know, exorbitant price? Has he understood even how that loan was contracted and the, who the stakeholders that were involved, especially that it was done jointly with another country? They were in opposition, you know, all over saying that the, the intended uh, uh, construction of the dual carriageway from Lusaka to Copper Belt, um, costing at one point something billion dollars was exorbitant. Without looking at the face of all the, the, the feature of that particular road, the facilities that were going to accompany the construction of that road, which were also going to improve in terms of the outlook of our towns and you know, you know, certain facilities that will accompany that particular road, when they get into government, they don't tell the Zambian people that, yes, when you look at the design and everything that is there and the facilities that are there, it's just viable to, to, to put it at a cost that it was present, you know, that was expressed. But because maybe they uh, felt that we can't spend so much money on that particular road, they also don't tell the Zambian people that the only way to reduce the price is to reconfigure uh, the road in terms of size. Uh, and also remove some of the things that they considered, you know, facilities that possibly can only be constructed uh, in the future. And then after they remove all that, they come up with the, a basic road, but costing something like 700 and something million dollars. No, I did correct you. It's 568 million dollars. Well, what, what, whatever. But you can see that they, they've, to come up, to, to come to that particular price, was not because they have said that, no, they were going to construct the same thing at a cost of 500 and, uh, uh, we said, six, five, eight six, eight million dollars. The truth of the matter is that after they have reconfigured the entire scope of what was supposed to be done. And that's the reality. Now, moving to the issue of raise of street, street uh, vendors. vendors yes. it, maybe for once, uh, Ms. Sankoma, uh, for you, the reason I even accepted to feature with you is because outside politics, I want to consider you as one who has made public pronouncements as an economist, right? Mm -hmm. And politics should not make us degenerate. Mm -hmm. We have to speak to reality. One of the greatest assets of political leaders is their mouth. And leadership actually is about influencing people through what you communicate. And therefore, what we say we must put high premium on it. We shouldn't begin to justify casually that when a leader makes a particular pronouncement and they abrogate, we find a way to skate around to justify. The reason the Zambian people are you know, um, unhappy with the UPND government is that most of the things that Mr. Aka Indechrema pronounced, he has actually abrogated. When it comes to the street vendors, Mr. Aka and HLM, even when the circumstances are different from today, our circumstance at that time, if you remember when we just got into government, of course he has acknowledged that both me and him were in MMD before. You understand? In MMD, the issue of vendors was managed differently. Under Dr. Chiruba, right. there was even a desk at the uh, State House that had to do with vendors. So this is a historical situation. Right. Under patriotic front, Mr. Sata, remember, he said, I'm a friend of vendors. At some point when there were decisions made by Professor Kandru, I think, or Masewa's local government, he made a pronouncement, don't touch them. I will handle them myself. You remember that? Yes. Of course, he eventually got sick and uh, things deteriorated and we lost him. 
uh, he didn't live to implement what he had uh, uh, pronounced. President uh, Edika Chagarungo came in uh, and while certain things were being put in place to manage that situation, were you know, affected at that time by Corella. And Corella was not because people were trading in the streets. Corella was because of the fact that the water uh, um, uh, table uh, in Lusaka, because of the uh, mushrooming of diff, you know, unplanned you know, uh, residential uh, places and so on, and people uh, before Wama was established and I think uh, given teeth to manage and uh, regulate the uh, usage of water, whether groundwater and otherwise, the Lusaka was polluted because uh, both sanitation uh, you know, services uh, were not provided effectively, and to that effect, I think water began to mix up. And having been privileged to have been Minister of Water Development yeah. and, and Sanitation, I can tell you that when we were hit with um, Corella, uh, it was inevitable that we manage the crowds. Because we even had to shift from having people you know, admitted in hospitals to start having them admitted in stadiums. And drastic measures needed to be taken. But even with those drastic measures being taken, the UPND did not support. Ms. Hakainde said, if I was the president, I would mitigate. One, I would compensate all those people who are being removed from the, you know, the streets. I would not destroy their makeshift um, uh, uh, stands or, uh, or you know things. I mean places they used to sell their merchandise. He would find alternative places for them to do what to go and trade. Even when what we are dealing with was a totally a unique situation, unique in the sense that we are responding to a disaster in terms of having a, a disease like cholera that can wipe out a population within days. Now, fast forward today. Even with those pronouncements, Ms. Haka Indechirema has been boasting that he is a methodical leader. If he is methodical, how is it that uh, these vendors in Lusaka just woke up to a rude shock that their makeshift uh, stands have been destroyed, their merchandise for some of them have been destroyed, and then we're having the Minister of Local Government trotting around to try and justify uh, that kind of action? If they were methodical, they should have put in place mechanisms that will cause, will not cause our people on the streets, to be ushered into now complete, not only poverty, because they're already poor, in complete you know, misery, because they can't even afford food today, because they have been, uh, even the little capital they had, uh, some of which invested in those makeshift uh, arrange, you know, uh, structures, and the merchandise, because some of them, you know, their capital is as small as maybe 150, is as small as 200, is as small as 500, 1,000 at most for some of those people on the street. They live hand to mouth. And we know that. At least for Mr. Noah Nkoma, I know that he would know that because most of his uh, career, his office was in town, in under finance. He knows how people struggle on the street there. So they go in the morning. With their, they order whatever they can order from some either Kamara or somewhere. They go on the street, they sell. The little profit they get in the evening, that is the one they're going to buy the food they'll eat that particular evening and leave some for tomorrow. And then go back again. It's the same cycle. So when a government becomes so reckless as to go and uh, wipe out if their little capital, there's no justification at that particular point. Especially a government that made pronouncement that they're going to take care of those street vendors. The action so far as a patriotic front, we are against the method used to get them out of um, uh, uh, the streets. Especially that the, the, the markets they are wanting to talk about, if you see in Lusaka, it's the market that we, we constructed. They haven't constructed, not even a toilet, our UPND. When, when they have borrowed so far under their watch within two years, over one billion. There is no infrastructure they can point to. Me, I can boastfully tell you that uh, the money borrowed under our, our watch, and there's no economy that never borrows. And let's see, Mr. Economist here will tell us there's a country that never borrows. Every country, including America, borrows. But when you borrow, you must have something to show. For now, what they have borrowed by UPND, there's nothing to show, save for high price of minimum, high price of fertilizer, and now our people being ushered into abject poverty by removing and the from the states. Mr. No Nkoma comes in, I have a follow-up question on you, Honorable Nakachinda. I mean, what was your agenda about street vending? 
were you going to allow them even now should you have uh, actually won the, the election and what alternative solutions are you offering uh, uh, to the UPND with regards the removal uh, of street vendors from from the street first of all let's let's not uh, demonize street vending it exists street vending is a mode of uh, of trade uh, Mr. Nkoma, I'm sure agrees with me. And it happens uh, all over the world. The issue is just to get it properly organized, to make sure that uh, issues of sanitation, you know, are guaranteed because people need to trade in cleaner uh, environment. <coughs> Two, you have to define what constitutes street vending. What are the products are you, can you permit for people to vend? And even in doing that, what are the minimum standards in terms of uh, um, the facility they must use. Do you want people to go and just pick plants somewhere and come and start making uh, makeshift uh, uh, what structures in town and in the end it looks uh, messy? Or do you want to guide that if you are to trade, these are the products on the streets that are permitted? And even the local authorities able to get uh, one kwacha, two kwacha from those that are trading to be able to provide the service, uh, in this case sanitation, and guarantee that the people have access to clean water. Because that is what eventually speaks to uh, issues of uh, hygiene and waterborne diseases and so on and so forth. The, let's uh, tackle matters with principle. Principle here is not that vending is bad in itself. It's basically just getting them organized. Removing them in the manner where they were removed is just that people have failed to apply themselves on how best they can organize street vendors in Lusaka. And even to designate, you can designate that, okay, there are how many streets in Lusaka? There could be three, four streets. You can say, okay, this street, we are going to permit street vendors. And even the customers, in this case, we, the Zambian people, we should know that if I want to go and buy Sarawula, or if I want to buy fruits, I can go on Freedom Way. There is a way they have been organized to sell fruits. The issue and the answer is to get an organized way in which our people can trade as vendors, other than just throwing them on in the streets. I can tell you, it's like an example somebody was giving me yesterday. That you have children, and uh, your neighbor's children, maybe one hour come and one hour go apart, and you are having a meeting as parents, and uh, because they are making noise there and it's becoming a nuisance, you just go and say, "Get out! I don't want you anywhere near here." And then they leave, but you don't even mind on where they have gone because, as far as you are concerned, you just needed to relieve yourself of that noise and the nuisance that you thought you were causing by playing out there. When they go, you see one day, two days, they don't appear. As a parent, you should be concerned. Because you may end up just having your children coming in handcuffs. They have started committing offenses because they left where you were having an eye on them. Those street vendors that have been thrown in uh, the compounds, we don't know what uh, is going to come from there. And I can tell you it's a time bomb until we get ourselves to a point where we can organize how our people live in society. And I think that's where I could end. Uh, I, I will let you respond now, uh, Mr. Noron Koma, but let me quickly remind our listeners that this is uh, the, two, the Thursday edition of uh, the Benny issue here on the Happy World of Five FM radio on 89.9 in Lusaka and the surrounding areas. Remember, we are also live on our partner radio stations, uh, Tuta FM in Mansa uh, is covering this program live. We are also live on Muchinga Radio in Chinsali, covering the rest of Muchinga province. Uh, iWave FM radio in uh, Chingola covering the rest of the Copper Belt. Uh, we are live also on Spice FM in Kabwe covering uh, the rest of Central Province and Web FM radio in uh, Mazabuka covering Southern Province. And uh, let me also make mention that we are also live on uh, Utunensu uh, uh, Facebook page as well as Honorable Nakachinda's uh, uh, personal Facebook page, uh, also on Falcon Media. We are live on that one. Smart Eagles is carrying this one live. Zambia Reports, Grindstone Television Zambia, and Citizen TV Zambia are carrying this particular program live. live. And my guest in the studio is uh, uh, Mr. Rafa Onakachinda, who is the Patriotic Front Information and Publicity Chairperson and member of the Central Committee. And also Mr. Noel Nkoma, an economist and uh, the United Party 
for National Development UPND member. Now, uh, Mr. Nkoma, yes. the question of street vending. Yes, yes. Let me just uh, respond to one or two comments from what you have said, then I'll sure. go that. I want to take quick, quick time. Yes, quick. It will be very quick. First of all, uh, my brother here talks about uh, us having downsized uh, the, uh, what you call, uh, uh, proposal for the Lusaka and Kaju. I'm privileged that I sit on the Public-Private Partnership Council of Ministers, and I can tell you that uh, from the 1.3 uh, billion, which was a, a projected cost for this project, mm. the only things that were removed are uh, what you call satellite hotels. I think they were put, thinking of a hotel in Kawe, they were thinking of a hotel in Kapiliposhi. Those two cannot justify a reduction from 1.3 billion to six, just under six hundred billion dollars. They already that uh, that the, the 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 reduction is almost seven hundred million dollars. Are you telling me two hotels can cost seven hundred million dollars? The township roads are still there. They're going to be done. So that is uh, neither here nor there. Then uh, lastly, uh, on the issue of uh, the Kasukula Bridge, which my brother talked about, a fantastic project. Nobody doubts it. Uh, funded by, I think, the help of Korea or something. Can he also admit that at the time that they were leaving government, that project had, uh, had, had stopped? Why? It's because they are defaulted on paying the contractor. They are defaulted on paying the contractor. Who it had to take the Botswana president to fly here to come and meet him. Uh, he came to meet President Lungu before he left office. He came also to meet with President HH. To, to maybe, maybe because uh, uh, some of these uh, sweeping statements, uh, just to remind him as he continues, I want to disrupt mm. again. <laughs> when you say that it had stopped, I'm sure the Zambian people do remember and they can Google that that project was complete and it was even commissioned. No, no, no. Misaka and the HRM commissioned the second time no. with the president who is not even connected in that regard except as a you know, downstream beneficiary no, no, in no, a Rwandan, no, it's the it's Rwandan not. president. No. But otherwise you remember that uh, as African Union um, you know, chair, uh, President Chisekedi, uh, Botswana president, including Munanga, I mean, uh, Mr. President Munangagwa, commissioned together with President uh -huh. Rung. If he doesn't know that as a fact, no, no. then it possibly we have to question all the submissions he has been making no, no. because I think the yes. rhetoric in UPN no, no, is quite. There's uh, no rhetoric here. I can, let, let, I can promise mm. you Continue, Mr. that there was a default yes. because I, for one, I knew uh, one of the persons who was involved as a subcontractor of that project. It had to take the new donor administration to pay the areas for the project to be completed. If it was commissioned during that time, why was it not operationalized by way of traffic allowing to, to flow? When did traffic start flowing? Commissioning of a project means that you operationalize the project. It was not operationalized. So on that score, I can bet with my brother from here. We can even go to this of infrastructure. I can demonstrate to him that what he's saying is actually uh, not as correct as it were. Now, let me talk about uh, uh, street vending. <laughs> You know, one thing I feel so sad and sorry about PF is that uh, they are proud of their record of uh, impoverishing Zambians to the point that uh, you created poverty never seen in the history of this country before. Right? To the point that those people who are coming as street vendors, because you created the thing, you were helpless to be able to control it. So to you, the only way out was to let them uh, uh, break the laws that they were they had sworn by upholding the constitution to protect the minister of local government and uh, 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 local government and rural development has been very clear. These people were preaching the law, but we have got a plan for them. He said they had countless meetings. There was a ministerial statement, and the problem that I have here is that my brother here has sat in that parliament. He knows what a, a ministerial statement is. Has he taken time to understand the ministerial statement as presented by the Honorable Minister, where he made it very clear we have engaged these people. It's not starting now. It has been ongoing. We have a plan for them. We are relocating them. And it's basically, you cannot in, at any point take pride in your people's suffering. There's no government. Whether it's thought takes pride in its people's suffering. If I do anything, I open my statement, transforming people's lives. We want to do things 
in an orderly manner by making sure that whatever solutions or interventions we are making now, they should be sustainable. They should be sustainable. They were doing things for political convenience. Because in as far as PF was concerned, the mushrooming of street vending to the extent that they never had respect for private property. Can you imagine, Zach? Look at that uh, beautiful hotel. What you call it? Uh, Hilton? Yes. There's Hilton, there's Protea. Do they know how much investment those developers put into those structures? Hilton alone, it's an APSA project. How much does it put in? Millions of dollars. Protea, Marco Donald's project, millions of dollars. They had no clientele. The, they were becoming white ships. To them, they had no respect for private property. As long as they can count the anarchy there in terms of a disorganized market, to them they were counting. They were not counting law and order. Apart from Zanako, Bank of Zambia, and maybe two other banks, Stanch had left. Their building has been up for sale. Up to now, it's how much? How many years? Maybe one year, two years? Nobody has offered work because nobody wanted to go to the CBD. The property values were collapsed under their watch. Zanako, I mean, sorry, Indo Zambia, they just left. But they started looking to exit at the time that there was this whatever. So to us, what we are saying, let us begin to do things which may be as painful as they are, but we, they can be sustainable. So that even if by misfortune, PF had to come back, they'll find a well-organized and properly functioning local government. Let's not do things just to appease uh, people. No, we are promoting anarchy. And I think UPNT did not campaign on the platform to promote anarchy. I submit. I'm talking about PF coming back. <laughs> I would like to... to well, uh, it's a reality that our, fr our friends must uh, begin to live with. Uh, because I think uh, that one of the reasons why I'm giving the leverage for, you know, my brother to continue trying to justify uh, their failures. It's not failures. These are successes. <laughs> yeah. Just tell me which is a failure here. You know, I mean, <laughs> which is a failure? <laughs> <laughs> These are not failures. We are demonstrating. And the numbers don't lie. Mm. Numbers don't lie. Let him just you know, what he's referring <laughs> to as failure. Yeah. So in this case, you can see that even from uh, the the submission that uh, he's making, they are prioritizing, as far as they are concerned, the ones who are important to them are the elite. Because, as far as they are concerned, those on the streets don't matter. So they will take measures to protect those who own, you know, hotels, who own um, these properties. But I can tell you that even the shift he's referring to and trying to sneak in to justify that brutal, um, you know, brutish approach that the UPND deployed to remove street vendors is not correct. The CBD uh, over time, at some point, when he possibly uh, he was operating from Lusaka, I mean, the town had not expanded. Today, we have malls dotted across uh, the city of Lusaka. And therefore, the population uh, of, uh, of people trekking to town to go and do their transaction has reduced. And it is only natural that, uh, having been a banker himself, that the bank will follow where the clients are. And they've been moving from town to Manda Hill, to uh, Pinacomo, to Woodlands Shopping Mall, to Lewanika Mall, and to other, other places. And for Stanchard, for example, they have moved somewhere at, at, at the suburb around about to build their headquarters. The building he's talking about was their headquarters for many years. But why they moved there? They have moved there because of street vendors. Yes. Then he is not a, a proper banker or economist. Actually, the ones who you are supposed to even crop to be able to sustain your your banking um, you know uh, business are the small scale you know business people not if they are encouraged not uh, no but the issue of uh, <laughs> getting them organized was my submission <laughs> that the only thing that they have failed to do is to get the vendors organized i am against just like patriotic front of the you know not just removing them from the streets without providing mechanisms because street vending is not a crime 
Mr. Banda, street vending is not a crime. The reason it's called street vending is because it exists. Even in America, there are street vendors. In the UK, there are street vendors. Yeah. How is it that today street vendors are looked like uh, uh, demons who should not be tolerated in town, according to Mr. Nkoma? No, 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 no. <laughs> and, they, and they are the ones who are chasing people from town to go to town. No, no, that is uh, demeaning, uh, no, no. my brother. I, 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 those who are like Mr. Nkoma, Wandarama, and our HH Wandarama, ngono amena maenda muma 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 banku amene vajamena kuri sapa street vaja ka 10 kwacha ka 20 kwacha the ones who are saving in these banks so how can a bank run away from his clients and start following people who don't uh, even do transaction every day mr nkoma goes to the bank possibly uh, once in a blue moon because he, he, in terms of day to day activities he has a mechanism through which food are bought and so on but for those people every day they are trading and every day they have to, you know, um, uh, engage in terms of banks and so on. And the banks make money from multiple of, you know, transactions. And I think the people of multiple transactions are the ones who are below Mr. Nkoma. Munga is a MPF of Vutika, but most of them are the ones who No, that's a, that's a narrative that we try to feed. <laughs> but that, that, that's, a real, that's a real Let's term. move on to one yeah. item that uh, keeps coming before I open the phone lines. And I would like this uh, tackled. I know it will probably come up uh, yes. with follow-up questions, but I've seen uh, a number of them sending that particular question. Yes. It's the status quo of the Development Bank of Zambia and, uh, and the way forward for, you know, even uh, human resource. In this case, uh, uh, can you come in because you have been the board chair of uh, uh, Development Bank of okay. Zambia. You, you, I, I'll be very brief because, right. the, like you have rightly said, I'm yeah. no longer the board chairperson. Right. So all I can say is that uh, uh, I will only allude to the fact that he, the minister has already pronounced himself. The bank was basically uh, extremely abused to the extent that those who had the charge to run this bank. My brother here, Ono Bonakachinda, was in cabinet. I think they must have been receiving reports. Those who borrowed, mostly political aligned and exposed persons connected to the ruling party at the time, 98% failed to repay the, the loans that they got. I think it's in public domain. And when you have a situation where uh, almost 100% of the people who have borrowed failed to pay, the bank cannot continue to exist. Mm. So that is a long and short. It's, it's a, uh, with what due respect that you are no longer the board chair, yes, yes. but the fact that you, at the time you were the board chair, you made uh, very significant pronouncements. You well, entered DBZ, uh, a, 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 an institution that is it's back a on very track and it's going, it's going it's, to survive it, and uh, yes, flourish. Yes, my, what happened? My, my board and our intention was that we we're going to revive the bank. Right. But mind you, we are appointees of shareholders. Right. We only represent the shareholders. And where are the shareholders? The government is the majority shareholder, about 90, 92% uh, equity. Now, to the point that the board can make its case, ultimately it's a shareholder because you need to recapitalize the bank. I think the Bank of Zambia statement was very clear. The bank has remained undercapitalized or capital deficiency for many years. From 2014, when the Oro government was in office, 2014, despite the euro bonds, that they, they got in billions, the DFI, which is the development bank, was not capitalized. Our intentions, as good as they were, we failed. Because without capital, it was so stressful and the most difficult uh, time for me to sit on a board as chairman, where I became helpless. So I can promise you, we had all the good intents, and I know the Minister of Finance his team, the presidents, had good intents, but I think it was overwhelmed with the, uh, the situation to the extent that the Bank of Zambia, being the regulator, exercised its what you call uh, supervisory action. Because ultimately, it's the Bank of Zambia that gives you a license to, to operate. So it's them who can decide your fate should you breach the license conditions. So that's what I can say for now. In terms of the way forward, I think let the, yeah. the shareholder decide uh, de make the, that. Uh, determination. Otherwise, I think I can only remain grateful uh, to the President, to the Honorable Minister of Finance, who have given me an opportunity to preside over the affairs of the Development Bank of mm -hmm. Zambia. 
Honorable Nakachinda, you want to make a comment? In the well, I think the comment I can make is that yeah. I was avoiding basically myself to uh, raise that issue because I was going to seem to be personal. But uh, uh, it's, it's important to ask the question because it also generally exposes um, the demeanor of our friends in European Day. Until a disastrous uh, situation boomeranged in the face of the chair, he was giving all of us uh, an impression that uh, this whole thing is, uh, you know, um, uh, buoyant, we will uh, restructure and it will work and all that. You don't have to worry about the bank. Conveniently, now that it has collapsed his PF, the blame game will never stop. The day he's going to work uh, in a particular situation, uh, very soon we'll end up with the uh, PF being blamed for people's either uh, <laughs> losing their, I don't know how I, how I can put it, because we're blamed for everything. You can't say that the people who borrowed were, were PF, uh, Mr. Nkoma. You, as a bank, have a mechanism you use to get people access facilities. And if those mechanisms have not been followed, it means that there's somebody incompetent there. And that is the person you're supposed to deal with. You're appointing? Uh, no, wait. Yes, is your appointee. Ah, you are an appointee of uh, of uh, Aga in the HLM and yes. you have collapsed the bank. No, no, it collapsed before even. <laughs> no, I'm just telling you <laughs> that if that's what we're talking about, you are an appointee of Ms. Aga in the HLM and you have collapsed the bank. Fan fantastic job. But all no, I'm saying is no, that. The man who was in charge has, has finally been sent to jail, <laughs> isn't it? Yes. Uh, wait, wait, wait. No before you proceed in that regard, what I'm just say, underscoring is that. Oh, today, uh, we have CEC, for example, right. that uh, from a political point of view has turned into a UPND secretary. No, no. It's actually a reward machinery towards UPND cadres. But we counsel ourselves that uh, CEC must have its own standard. Even UPND cadres are Zambians. Some of them gen genuinely so do business. And they have even possibly bankable, what? Uh, Pro business pro yeah. projects. You can't be blacklisted because you belong to a political party. If at all, fast forward, those UPND cadres that are being given monies from CEC fail to pay. I don't think they are the ones you are going to first of all blame. You blame the system that was supposed to be to, to vet because at the DBZ, he can't say that all those who borrow, that's being mischievous. We know of people who are sponsors of UPND. We know of people who are members of UPND. We know even businesses that were connected even to the president himself that has gotten facilities from DBZ. But conveniently here we say it was PF. Let's accept when things have not worked out well, like you're putting it, and maybe the management of the bank was not really good. And I can tell you the other aspect is that the, the, you know, the, 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 the Development Bank of Zambia was supposed to be a facility that helps uh, mainly, in principle, local business people to graduate from small scale to be, you know, uh, to large become, you know, uh, in, uh, large corporates. Uh, large corporates, if you like. That was the principle. But as it were, because there is also, um, we have always been under capture from imperialist organization and so on, some of which run banks, because we don't really have a local bank now. I was at some point very proud when I saw that uh, a renowned bank and economist had started a bank, which if we as Zambians were really patriotic, we were supposed to have supported that bank so that we have our own. But we know that they are operating in a very hostile environment because these foreign banks have a way in which they put, put strings to choke the local upcoming banks. But in Zambia, we are proud to sit with Mr. Nkoma and say, there's a bank in Asir. Yeah. And that is how we end up destroying our own things. DBZ can't today be discussed in the lenses of you know, politicians, Patriotic Front and UPND. That's being reckless. 
and patriotic, member, patriotic front members are Zambians. UPND members are Zambians. And if they are doing a legitimate business, that business must be supported. Absolutely. This attitude that the UPND want to introduce of wanting to be selective that, no, because it was PF, it was bad. No, that's not correct. We want UPND members, if they are doing legitimate business, to benefit from facilities that are around. The same way that patriotic front members and everybody must also be seen as Zambians and they must benefit from facilities that exist and we must promote a culture of promoting prosperity, not poverty. Yes. I think that is the bottom line for me. Can I, I totally agree with uh, uh, my brother. I think that is uh, basically a cross-cutting uh, uh, pro yeah. pronouncement. Yeah. And I think what I can pick from Honorable Agachilda, he's talking about uh, uh, our own indigenous uh, growth. And I think he has uh, made a very uh, a profound statement to the effect that we have failed to preserve and support that which is ours. Very important. And we should stop this issue. And it's correct to say this one deserves uh, support because he's aligned to this party. No. The first qualification is that you are a Zambian. And I think, Honorable Nakachinda, if you watched my first Sunday interview, I agree that even politically exposed persons who are doing legitimate and general business have got a business case to make, should be supported, devoid of any discrimination, whether religion or political. So I think, my brother, that is, uh, I think, leadership on your part, and we should support that. Let me take phone calls.